Hello, my name is Drew Zimmer, and I am an infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist at Cox Health in Springfield, Missouri. Today, I am going to review the pertinent drug information pertaining to HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors as it applies to the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. This review is presented by the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists. The objectives of this talk are to briefly review the mechanism of action, safety issues, and drug interactions of HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which will from now on be referred to as statins, discuss the theoretical benefit of statin therapy in COVID-19, and evaluate any pertinent literature and future studies aimed at statin usage in COVID-19. Currently, there is no available FDA-approved therapy that specifically targets the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There have been many theories and proposed therapies, most rooted in the efficacy of that agent suppressing growth in vitro or historical activity against SARS-CoV and MERS. But as of yet, the literature evaluating these therapies have been sparse and have concerning limitations. This slide lists the proposed therapies and those with an asterisk have been presented by SIDP members. There are planned presentations for many of the therapies that do not have asterisks. You can also find updated versions of both the remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine chloroquine presentations. Statins are FDA indicated for reducing the risk of MI, stroke, revascularization procedures, and angina in patients without CHD but multiple risk factors, and also in patients with CHD. It is also indicated for heterozygous and homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Statins work by inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase, which is responsible for the conversion of HMG-CoA into mevalonate. The decrease in mevalonate leads to decreased creation of cholesterol. There are also possible immunomodulation effects of statins, which will be discussed in a future slide. Some common adverse effects of statins include statin-associated muscle symptoms. These include myalgia, myopathy, myositis with elevated CK, and rhabdomyolysis. Hepatic and renal toxicity can also occur, along with increased serum transaminases and the onset of new diagnoses of diabetes mellitus type 2. Although statins are considered safe and have a long history of usage, care should be taken in patients who present with hepatic issues. Recent data from New York showed that myalgias were present on admissions in roughly 23% of COVID-19 patients. Limited data from China showed a low percentage of patients presenting with hepatic issues. So care should be taken and treatments individualized for patients showing any signs of hepatic toxicity or hepatic impairment. Many statins are substrates of the cytochrome P450 metabolism system. This slide lists some of the major drug interactions with some of the therapies that have been proposed and have been used for the treatment of COVID-19. It's important for pharmacists to recognize the drug interactions and make appropriate interventions when necessary. The proposed rationale for statin usage in COVID-19 is that there is a cardiovascular element to COVID-19. Statins may play a role in innate immunity. And there is some data and literature using statins in particular in viral pneumonia. We will look at each one of these in the following slides. Reports from China and Italy have shown that people with CHD, diabetes, and hypertension all had higher rates of mortality and severe disease. Looking at the literature from these areas, one limitation found was that the percentage of patients who were on a home statin regimen were not included. This makes it very difficult to evaluate if there was a protective effect of the statin in patients who had comorbidities and either survived or presented with non-severe disease. One of the theoretical roles that statins may play in helping the innate immune response is by helping regulate myeloid differentiation primary response 88, or MyD88. It was noted in MERS-CoV infections that both overexpression and underexpression 
were related to increased mortality. It was found that in SARS-CoV infection, this led to increased MyD88 gene pathway activity. The downstream effect of both of these were to activate the NF-kappa beta pathway, which leads to increased inflammation by the release of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Statins are known to preserve my, the, my D88 levels during both hypoxia and stress, and by so doing mitigate NF-kappa beta activity, which can decrease the production of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. The ability of statins to maintain these MyD88 levels at normal levels could possibly be protective for patients with COVID-19. More data and literature and research is needed to make this assumption for COVID-19. There is some literature of statin usage in bacterial infections, but at this time, the results have been conflicting in regards to whether statins confer a benefit in sepsis and bacterial pneumonia. For the purpose of this presentation, we will concentrate on viral pneumonia. And although no clinical data exists for a protective role for statins in COVID-19, some literature exists for statin usage in influenza. We will look at a few of these studies in the next couple of slides. The first study by Frost was a large matched cohort study that collected data from a health maintenance organization with patients from several moderate sized organizations in New Mexico. The outcomes the authors found were that for moderate dose statin usage, they found a significant reduced odds ratio of influenza or pneumonia death and COPD death. The statin utilized, there was no specific data and a very interesting cutoff for differentiating between a moderate and low daily dose of statin was set at four milligrams per day. The average daily dose for the patients was 10 milligrams per day. The choosing of four milligrams per day is confusing and it wasn't discussed in the study setup. And I had, didn't really, I wasn't able to find any sort of conversation or evaluation of why that dosing was selected. Some limitations for this study were that there were a few adjustments for covariates. There were unmeasured confounders, and there also could have been a healthy user effect. Referring to that patients who are on a statin may already be exhibiting healthy behaviors, and they also may have access to the healthcare system and do better in these studies. The second study look at, looked at the usage of statins and mortality among patients hospitalized with laboratory-confirmed influenza. The patients were taken from the CDC's Emerging Infections Program. The patients represented 59 counties in 10 different states. Data was analyzed for hospitalized adults during the 2007-2008 influenza season. Patients who were on a statin were more likely to have been vaccinated against influ influenza that season than patients who were not on a statin. The outcomes of this study that were found that the administration of statins prior to or during hospitalization were associated with a protective odds of death. Again, which statin was utilized was not mentioned specifically and there were several limitations as well. One limitation was that the cohort may not represent all persons who are hospitalized with influenza because the patients who were admitted with influenza but not tested would not have been picked up by the surveillance data. The info was taken from chart review, which limited the quality of information regarded, regarding statin usage as well as other medications. They, cannot, they also could not evaluate statin usage after discharge and there may also have been a healthy user effect in these patients as well. The next slide contains information on the next two studies on statin usage and in influenza. The first study by Brett was a retrospective case controlled study using the United Kingdom's Influenza Clinical Information Network Database which provided detailed information on 1,520 patients admitted with laboratory-confirmed 
2009 Pandemic Influenza A. Between April 2009 and January 2010, in patients age greater than 34. What they found was there was no significant association between pre-admission statin use and severity of outcome. The statin utilized, again, there was no specific data mentioned other than that simvastatin was the most common statin that was taken by the patients. The author's explanation for the reason that there was no significant association was they felt the benefit of statins may be too modest for the study to de detect and that the study may have been underpowered to detect a difference. The study was confined to hospitalized patients only, so and the effect of statin usage on outpatients with influenza may have strengthened the study and found that there was a significant association between use, statin use and severity of outcome. The second study by Kwong was a population-based cohort study over 10 influ influenza seasons from 1996 to 2006 using databases in Ontario, Canada in adults greater than 65 years of age who had received influenza vaccine and they separated them out by those who were on a statin, 23%, versus those not prescribed a statin, 77%. The outcomes that they found were that statin usage was associated with a small protective effect for hospitalization, 30-day pneumonia mortality, and all-cause mortality. This study actually did mention some of the statins that were utilized, with atorvastatin, simvastatin, and pravastatin being the most common. All other statins were just put into a category of other statins and not specifically mentioned. Some of the limitations of the study was it was an observational study, there were nonspecific outcomes, and there was a lack of information on meds while the patients were hospitalized. The authors also mentioned in their conclusion that although this study was statistically significant, it was minimally protective against influenza, and that could, it could be easily attributed to residual confounding. They also said that public health officials should focus on other measures to re reduce morbidity and mortality in influenza. The next slide looks at a couple of studies looking at statin usage and sepsis and ARDS, or the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. The literature that has come out from China, Italy, and even from the United States has shown that patients with severe COVID-19 disease progress to severe ARDS. So the usage of statins in this disease state is interesting to evaluate. The first study was a multi-center double-blind clinical trial that evaluated simvastatin 80 milligrams daily or placebo for a maximum of 28 days in patients with ARDS. The outcomes found that although the statin was safe and associated with minimal adverse effects, there were no significant differences in ventilator-free days, days free of non-pulmonary organ failure, or mortality at 28 days. So in this study, it found that statin usage was not associated with any benefit in ARDS. The second study was rosuvastatin for sepsis-associated acute respiratory distress syndrome. This was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized trial looking at rosuvastatin, 40 milligram loading dose, then 20 milligrams daily, versus placebo for a maximum of 28 days. So again, 28 days was set as in the first trial. So both of these trials are pretty similar in their setup. This study was stopped early. There was no significant difference in 60-day in-hospital mortality or ventilator-free days. So neither of these studies show that statin usage in sepsis and ARDS are effective at helping patients. Now we're going to look at some of the randomized controlled trials that are ongoing now. The first study, named 
preventing cardiac complication of COVID-19 disease with early acute coronary syndrome therapy, a randomized controlled trial, is looking at using medications that are targeted for acute coronary syndrome as a possible treatment for COVID-19. This study is a randomized parallel assignment perspective multi-center randomized controlled trial being con conducted in London. The target enrollment is 3,170 participants and they are currently recruiting per, per the clinical trials website. The primary outcome is all-cause mortality at 30 days after admission, with secondary outcomes, the absolute change in serum troponin from admission to peak value, discharge rate at 7 and 30 days, and intubation rate at 7 and 30 days. The intervention arm contains aspirin, 75 milligrams daily, clopidogrel, 75 milligrams daily, rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice daily, and atorvastatin, 40 milligrams daily versus a control arm with no intervention. Although this study is not a statin monotherapy for COVID-19, it is a base of therapy for acute coronary syndrome, which is being proposed as a possible therapy to prevent death and intubation rate in patients with COVID-19. The next clinical trial is a study of rixolitinib plus simvastatin in the prevention and treatment of respiratory failure of COVID-19. This is a randomized parallel assignment phase two clinical trial being conducted in Spain. The target enrollment is 94 participants and they are currently recruiting. The outcomes are primary, the percentage of patients who develop severe respiratory failure within seven days and the secondary outcomes are percentage of patients who develop severe respiratory failure, 14 days, length of ICU stay, length of hospital stay, survival rate at 28 days, six and 12 months, and adverse effect rates. The intervention is roxlitinib five milligrams orally every 12 hours for seven days, which will be increased to 10 milligrams orally every 12 hours for a total of 14 days, plus simvastatin, 40 milligrams daily for 14 days. In the control arm, there's no intervention. Rexolotinib is a kinase inhibitor, which is indicated for the treatment of intermediate or high-risk myelofibrosis, polycythemia vera, and steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease. The final clinical trial is coronavirus response, active support for hospitalized COVID-19 patients, or CRASH-19. This is a randomized factorial assignment multinational trial being conducted in London. The target enrollment is 10,000 participants and they are currently not recruiting. Primary outcome is death up to 28 days, with secondary outcomes, MI, myocarditis, respiratory failure, viral pneumonitis, acute renal failure, sepsis, stroke, GI bleed, non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation, ability to self-care at discharge, arrhythmia, and congestive cardiac failure up to 28 days. The intervention contains eight arms with seven active interventions and one control arm. The control arm is a no intervention while the seven active interventions contain aspirin monotherapy, losartan monotherapy, simvastatin monotherapy, then combinations of aspirin and losartan, aspirin and simvastatin, losartan plus simvastatin, and then aspirin plus losartan plus simvastatin. So in summary, patients who are on statin should remain on their home regimen unless there are contraindications. Drug interactions can occur with a few of the proposed treatments for COVID-19. You should use caution in patients with sepsis-induced hepatic injury. And there is no evidence or literature support for the addition of a statin specifically for COVID-19 therapy. Currently, there are three ongoing randomized controlled trials evaluating usage of statins in COVID-19. We should await results, and in particular, the evaluation of these results prior to re recommending any statin therapy for COVID-19.